It's a woke world after all. Here's two ridiculous stories about leftist absurdity. Woke activism. It wasn't called woke back then, but basically yeah. left-wing activism. They wouldn't have done it. I am getting so tired of this woke world. You know, be humorous, uh, like, you know, like we should, we should, like. You had, you, you, you could. Wokeness basically wants to make comedy illegal. And that is because this is a religious battle. It really is. The far left has devoted themselves to gender ideology as a religion. And so they see you saying, I'd like freedom from that as an attack on their faith. Yeah, it's so crazy. We fight the woke in the legislature. We fight the woke in the schools. We fight the woke in the corporations. We will never, ever surrender to the woke mob. Florida is where woke goes to die. Hello, welcome to Big Cat News. I am your host, Shucker Parlson. <clears throat> Our top story tonight, this is going to be depressing and sad. In fact, just researching it nearly put me in the hospital. Increasingly concerning variations of the woke leftist mob has not stopped playing in my head since I began watching Fox News a few weeks ago in preparation for this video. And I have had enough. Oh, what, you ask? It. I could be doing the most innocuous task and suddenly hear the voice of any given conservative droning on about the insane religious cult that is LGBTs, or the so-called vocabulary coined in Ben Shapiro's latest collection of essays. Relaxing was naturally not on the menu while preparing for this video. So I had to take matters into my own hands with today's sponsor, Two Dots. Two Dots is a free puzzle game for iOS and Android that has over 115 million downloads across the globe. And for good reason. Even if you just base your opinion on the visuals, the game is undeniably engaging, especially when it comes to the minimalist design and soothing color palettes. I personally love the design and I love how immersive the game map is. The first few levels of the map show what looks to be the inside of a house. And the further up you go on the levels, the further up the wall you get. So I think that's a nice touch. On a more technical level, the game is equally as fun to play. I'm already on level 33 at the time of filming and I'll probably be somewhere in the 50s by the time I'm editing. It feels like a nice brain workout. You can feel your problem solving muscles stretch with every puzzle, all from the comfort of your couch or office or bed. The levels also got harder as I advanced, which was all the more satisfying when I continued my streak of owning, poning, and destroying every level. And finally, with weekly events such as the treasure hunt, you can unlock unique rewards by completing seven special levels. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I really needed something to relax me and Two Dots really came in clutch. I've been able to breeze through a few levels in between my research process and come back to work feeling refreshed and capable of figuring out the puzzling conundrum that is conservatism. If this sounds like something that interests you, please download Two Dots through the link in my description and get to solving. Thank you Two Dots for giving me this opportunity and for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the hospitalization. In recent years, there has been a political undertaking of a word quite familiar within the Black community, woke. The term started as slang and was more often spoken aloud than written down, making the exact etymology unclear. What we do know is that it can be traced back at least to the 1920s and was used as a Black vernacular variant of the term woken or awake. As language evolved, it became synonymous with social change. To be woke effectively meant to be aware. Ashina Robinson, 
further defines wokeness as an in-group signal urging Black people to be aware of the systems that harm and otherwise put us at a disadvantage. End quote. And notes that it later came to encompass overarching diversity, inclusion, empathy, and to this day, blackness. Now, if we believe the 1920s to be the decade of wokeness, it would do us some good to contextualize the environment. This was after the Civil War and a few decades removed from the Reconstruction era. Slavery had just been abolished a couple decades prior, and the United States was trying its hardest to work towards equity for every man regardless of race. Obviously that didn't completely work out, so so I can see how the term evolved into the social justice cornerstone that it did. Despite the system of slavery being terminated, black people still had to reckon with the fact that they were not seen as equal in the eyes of some individuals, as well as some systems. George Lipschitz speaks of housing discrimination, educational discrimination, and as we're probably more familiar with, discriminatory judicial systems, police, and Jim Crow laws. It would make sense to try to be aware of this reality. If you're unaware, you're unable to fight against it. James Baldwin, one of my favorite writers of all time, once noted that white Americans have been encouraged to continue dreaming, and Black Americans have been alerted to the necessity of waking up. In 1962, William Melvin Kelly published a New York Times article titled, If You're Woke, You Dig It. And in it, Kelly describes the co-opting of Black language by white beatniks, the younger, more hip demographic of the 1950s and early 1960s. According to Wikipedia, white beatniks borrowed popular slang from jazz and hipster subcultures for their own use, Words like cat and dig, and yes, even woke, became frequent visitors to their lexicon. Kelly was something of a prophet, it seems, because this popular co-opting of black vernacular by trendy, oftentimes white subcultures, persists today. White TikTokers continuously misunderstand AAVE, often mispronouncing or misusing it in their sentences, or in graver examples, removing it from black culture entirely by referring to it as Gen Z slang or internet culture. And like Kelly mentions in the 1962 New York Times article, black people look upon this appropriation in confusion, sometimes even in light humor. Because when you say, girl, we are not Thanksgiving turkeys and that's on Fahrenheit period. What do you mean by that? That's like my favorite AAV struggle tweet, by the way. Mm. Decadent. <laughs> AAVE has its own grammar systems and definitions. It can be used to make complex thoughts and sentences much like English or any other language. If people outside of the dialect are going to use it, it must be used appropriately. This is significant to the war on woke, which is what I'm calling it, because the term has recently been appropriated by people outside of the black community to speak on issues antithetical to the purpose of the word. Conservatives have been increasingly using the term woke to refer to the enemy of their political beliefs. Elon Musk calls woke a mind disease that's ruining comedy, as if he has any stakes in the game as the unfunniest person on planet Earth. <laughs> Marco Rubio, a Florida senator, consistently calls wokeness progressive craziness, cultural issues that tear at our nation's fabric, and toxic nonsense. Even everyone's favorite poning, owning, liberal, destroying conservative, Ben Shapiro, wrote a book titled, If It Ain't Woke, don't fix it. And yet, despite their prolific use of the term, not a single conservative seems to understand what it truly means. Alan Smith et al. note that of the conservatives they interviewed for the publication of their article, very few understood the word or had a cohesive grasp of definition. A Republican Senate aide stated that it's just instinctual, like you know it when you see it. An argument so popular it made it all the way to the Supreme Court and so uninspired that the person who said it wishes he never did. And despite his constant use of the word woke, Marco Rubio stated, I don't know when I became aware of it. That's more of a clarion call to Republicans who have been tied to the sort of libertarian view of the economy that we shouldn't be playing a role in that. Is that even a sentence? Not even Ben Shapiro who wrote an entire book on the subject and who made condescending remarks about Ibram X. Kendi's apparent lack of defining structural racism, didn't define wokeness in his particular book. But trust he'll find a way to incorporate the term into another, the way he does with woke cola and vocabulary. Those are kind of funny, I'm not gonna lie. The importance of a clear definition cannot be understated. If you're unable to explicitly define something, how will you organize an effective movement against it? Well, 
little like this. We fight the woke in the legislature. We fight the woke in the schools. We fight the woke in the corporations. We will never, ever surrender to the woke mob. Florida is where woke goes to die. Shapiro makes an interesting point in his book concerning how the woke liberal leftist lecturing mob often broadens out the meaning of a word, end quote, to reach their agenda. His example is how leftists apparently consider anything incitement so long as it elicits strong emotions. And I found that intriguing, the emphasis on strong emotion. Steven Pinker, who is a well-known albeit controversial Harvard professor, also notes how words have two meanings when it comes to politics. He speaks of euphemisms and dysphemisms and how a word can have its literal meaning, but also a more emotionally charged meaning that can be utilized in political rhetoric. Of course, the left does this, but so do conservatives. The war on woke doesn't need a definition because the word itself has become a curse word. It gets people emotionally charged, especially people who understand the underlying meaning of that clarion call, as Marco Rubio described it as. It's not that conservatives are unable to define what they're against. It's just that the game of politics is to never say what you actually mean. It's easier to wink, nudge, and imply it to your constituents than to ever outright say it. That way, when an armed group of your supporters storm the Capitol, you can feign innocence. Allegedly. The inconsistency of defining the word they're essentially crusading against makes it harder to tell what conservatives are opposing if you don't know how to recognize patterns. The war on woke is left intentionally vague so that conservatives may list anything under the label, so long as they don't like it, without having to name the various phobias and isms that plague their movement. For instance, Despite not knowing exactly what woke is, they all managed to rally around similar topics. The constant attack of transgender healthcare and basic human rights, the continual dismissal of critical race theory and systemic racism, the weaponization of groomer against LGBTs and drag queens. Though they don't say what woke is, the pattern in which they attack certain groups makes it clear what they mean. But that still doesn't answer a crucial question I had before researching this video. Knowing the history of the word woke and how words can change meaning based on emotion or political agenda, I still wondered why conservatives adopted this specific term as a rallying cry. What is so evil about a word that once meant progress, equality, and black awareness? We could chalk it up to mere anti-Semitism, homophobia, transphobia, and racism, because there were many, many, many cases where that is their purpose, to harm others they view as inferior or unfairly protected. But I think another aspect of the conservative hate train stems from an impending doom within conservatives and people who relate to them. And this doom is expressed as, and oftentimes exploited by, moral panics. Therefore, the word of the day, dearest viewers, is fear. Conservatives and the people who may not be conservative but definitely feel seen by them are afraid. But of what? This is Big Cat News and we'll be right back after these messages. Whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. Hold up. I said certified freak seven days a week. Wet ass P word. Make that pullout game weak. In terms of a political body, conservative is a rather modern label. Conservative thinkers, however, are probably as old as tradition itself. According to Andrew J. Basevich, variations of the word conservative appeared in medieval times, especially in Italy, and were used within different contexts to either mean guardian of the law, protection and preservation, or security. During and immediately after the Napoleonic era, French political writers searched for a word that could describe a policy of moderation that married together the best of the old order with the necessities of the contemporary century. They championed conservatism, and the term spread across Europe thereafter and entered the English lexicon by the 1830s. Much of what traditional conservatism cherishes today can be simplified by that policy of moderation concocted by the French. Basevich likens conservatism more to an ethos or a disposition rather than a fixed ideology. Among other things, conservatives value traditional social arrangements of which they refuse to discard or alter, as well as a deep suspicion of utopian promises. Probably why they look 97 by the time they reach their 30s. They're stressed the fuck out. No happiness, no optimism, 
no WAP. It's rough out here for them. Above all, conservatives fear modernity. In fact, Basevich considers it a threat to traditional conservative values. If change must occur in a society, it must be done gradually and be vetted to high hell to ensure it won't kill us in the future. As he puts it, human society is no machine to be treated mechanically. The continuity, the lifeblood of a society must not be interrupted. And to the conservative, this is exactly what the dogmatic, dictatorial, domineering, despotic Democrats want for our future and our kids. They want LGBT living rooms and WAP garages. They want pronoun lunch at school and an honest conversation about civil rights that doesn't include the false eradication of racism after Martin Luther King Jr.'s cheek went oopsie daisy on that balcony. They want total anarchy. With this in mind, I began to better understand the politics of, say, Ben Shapiro, on a surface level. He speaks of leftist activism remolding, destroying, tearing away, hijacking. Uh, he's very passionate about this, as you can tell. Weaponizing and fighting tooth and nail against traditional systems and institutions. In fact, he considers this marginalization of tradition tantamount to national suicide that leads to the violent hunting of conservatives. No happiness, no optimism, no WAP told you. On one hand, you could surely make the argument that conservatives have been sometimes considered the ugly stepchild compared to progressive politics. An ugly stepchild that fought really hard to divorce itself from the rest of the family and then lost, but an ugly stepchild nonetheless. Basevich notes that in 1953, Harvard professor Louis Hart ruled that Conservatism, largely confined to the antebellum South, was beset by fantastic contradictions that made it an alien child in a liberal family. Tortured, confused, and doomed to destruction. I'm beginning to slur my words. My God. The so-called discrimination faced by conservatives today is pervasive. If you look up any of these key words, you'll undoubtedly be undulated with story after story of conservatives allegedly being fired for their super normal and not at all bigoted views. Talks about cancellation and censorship and super mega conservative hell are routinely expounded by the loudest, most talkative, most platformed conservatives on planet Earth. Ben Shapiro is consistently owned, pwned, and destroyed by leftist creators, and conservative podcast hosts are looked down upon with disgust and general confusion, as we have to grapple with the fact that the dude who hosted Fear Factor is now saying the N-word repeatedly on Spotify. It's not fair. It's Orwellian. Even people who may not identify as conservatives yet feel seen by their political campaigns are feeling put out. George Lipschitz notes how white Americans think anti-black racism is a thing of the past something that was owned, pwned, and destroyed by the 1950s, whereas anti-white bias is allegedly on the rise. Lipschitz uses the example of Abigail Fisher, a white student seeking to attend the University of Texas, but was denied admissions due to her grades. Instead of taking alternative routes, such as attending another school and transferring her credits to the University of Texas when her GPA raised, Fisher decided to sue the school instead, citing racial discrimination. Lipschitz notes that, 47 students with slightly lower grades and test scores than hers had been offered admissions because of documented evidence of special skills and achievements. While five of these students were people of color, 42 of them were white. In fact, 168 students of color with higher grades than Fisher were also denied admissions in the same year she was. Abigail Fisher's campaign against the enemy she considered to be affirmative action or anti-white bias was baseless. Yet as Michael Kimmel explains, her feelings aren't fake. Fisher and perhaps other white people like her do feel wounded by what they consider to be an unfair playing ground created by progressive priorities. The culmination of these fears, both the fear of modernity and the fear of being unfairly targeted adds weight to the war on woke. I would even argue that it explains its very existence because these fears don't just fester inside a person until they dissipate. That would be politically useless. Instead, it builds and builds and builds and transforms from fear into anger. It's not... Uh, it, it's not really about, you know, women being treated as independent, full, rounded human beings. It's about wet ass P-word.
I first read Michael Kimmel's book, Angry White Men, when I was in college. It was for a required senior seminar, which changes topics every semester. And the semester I took it just so happened to be about race. Ugh, I know what you're thinking. Those ingraining, indoctrinating, ideological idiots of the left struck again. Think of the children, the college-aged, capable of critical thought children. But I learned a lot from Kimmel about the subset of people who feel victimized by progressive politics, those who, quote, refuse to even be dragged kicking and screaming into that inevitable future. And I also learned about the relationship between fear and anger, how fear festers, transforms, and bleeds into a kind of rage that that's at once invisible, yet increasingly harder to ignore. Angry White Men is an important book because it explains why conservatives, both white and non-white people who are committed to white supremacy, are angry in the first place. And it does so with the intent to understand, not pwn, own, and destroy like I probably would. Kimmel asserts that to understand the anger pervading this demographic, we must understand their potential loss. That is, the loss that makes them feel most vulnerable, most inadequate. And to understand that, Kimmel explains, we must start with world history, the single greatest affirmative action program invented to benefit whiteness. George Lipschitz wrote an intriguing book about what he calls the possessive investment in whiteness. The way in which society protects, exalts, trusts, and supports white people in ways it simply doesn't for marginalized people. And I want to emphasize here that anyone can partake in the possessive investment in whiteness, no matter their race or ethnicity. Lipschitz himself notes the history of people of color working against themselves and each other in order to be validated or protected by whiteness, as they have seen what whiteness as a power can do for others. This possessive investment in whiteness also rests at an intersection of gender and race. Lipschitz notes how North America was already a racialized society by the time Europeans immigrated to it, marking it a white possession from the beginning of settler colonialism. We see this through the subjugation, indoctrination, and erasure of indigenous peoples as they were driven off their land and onto reservations. The centuries of chattel slavery, torture, segregation, and violence enacted against Black people. Naturalization laws that refuse citizenship to Asian people. The dehumanization, forced sterilization, and over-sexualization of women of color. And the exploitation of Asian and Mexican labor after the abolishment of slavery. Not to mention how the foundation of this country, which conservatives love to romanticize, was for and by white men. The all men are created equal and are endowed with certain unalienable rights, it's different coming from slave owners. With a history like this, whiteness becomes a form of power rather than just an identity or racial category. And it's a power that is at once invisible yet dependable to white people, up until the point it begins evading them. Lipschitz explains how minority disadvantages craft advantages for others. And in the case of racial discrimination, the people benefiting from systemic racism should be white people. That's how it was formed. That quirky little history I explained earlier, that wasn't just for shits and giggles. It was done for political gain, money, and to keep white people in power. Yet despite the safety net of white privilege via centuries of white supremacy, there are undoubtedly hundreds of thousands, if not millions of white people who don't live comfortable lives, who are impoverished, denied, and unheard. And this clashes with the worldview that we've come to understand. White Americans are told in so many words through the media they consume, through the history they read, through the systems that favor them, that they are at the top for a reason. They may not see whiteness and its benefits the way Lipschitz describes, but they still feel this unexplainable entitlement to a life that they aren't living. They were promised something that modern politics are not delivering. And they're searching for the cause of this delay. What excites them about Donald Trump is the fact that they think that finally there's somebody who goes to Washington who can actually bring about some fundamental change to the system. From what Trump said, I like what Trump yeah, said. Yeah, and it can't get any worse than what it is right now. And I think that a lot of this election is about tapping into a lot of anger that there is in this country. A lot of the homes uh, got foreclosed on, um, factories closed and lost of jobs. Is this going to affect how you feel about the election and how you vote in November? I'm looking at it pretty strongly right now, yeah. You know, my parents 
was both of them was able to retire, you know, pretty well. I mean, they're they're living a pretty good retirement and stuff, and they got nice homes. That, you know, they got their pensions and all that stuff, and they're having a nice retirement. But it isn't like that for this generation here, for my generation. What's it all like? that all What's that's it like? being taken away. You know, the American dream is not there any longer. But not only that, white men were also becoming increasingly aware of how little they were receiving for their part in manhood. Working, providing for the family, joining the military, none of it promised them prosperity. At least not in the way it did for their past patriarchs. The American dream, right before their very eyes, was curdling under the heat of broken promises. Now we can't have this conversation without considering class, though Michael Kimmel also urges us to consider that this fear-based anger can swallow anyone, even the rich. It originates not in any specific class, but can certainly be exacerbated by one. While race and gender are certainly the defining features of today's angry American, he argues, it is the growing chasm between rich and poor that is the engine of that rage. It literally takes two incomes to earn and what one income earned for a family 40 years ago, at the time of the publishing of this novel. And even then, not quite. Working class men watched the job market plunder with the closing of factories. Lower middle class men who owned small businesses were put out by larger corporations. Even upper middle class men, Kimmel argues, with jobs and pensions and health plans feel ripped off by affirmative action programs, immigration, welfare, taxation, in this general sense, that they're being had. I just wanna emphasize that I think this is a multifaceted argument and this video barely scratches the surface in my opinion. I also think that no one should have to worry about money. No one should have to struggle this hard in a world that promises prosperity and the economic fears that these individuals have, those are valid for the most part. The problem isn't the organic fear itself. It's that the target that they have unloaded this fear onto always happens to be marginalized people, people who are not causing their anguish, people who are not stealing anything from them. Even listening to some voters speak about job insecurity, the way in which they do it blames Hispanic people as a whole instead of the companies themselves. They blame black people or women or Asian people or Jewish people instead of challenging the actual source of the problem. Yes, people are afraid, but they're also so committed to individual justice that they'll fight tooth and nail to gain it at the expense of others, and the conservative pundits are recognizing and exploiting the sphere. That is at the heart of my criticism. Men, specifically those that subscribe to certain ideals of masculinity and upwards mobility via the American dream, are feeling frustrated, emasculated, and afraid of failure. Failure of their families, failure of themselves, themselves, failure of their fathers, their father's fathers, those who manage to pull themselves up by the bootstraps and seek golden opportunities in places angry white men seem to be currently drowning in. And as George Lipschitz notes, the more fearful, fragile, and headed for failure that white people feel, the more avidly they pursue the idealized fantasy of uninhibited power and agency to which they believe their whiteness entitles them. This idealized fantasy is best represented by the past, by the centuries of subjugation, oppression, and total power over so-called others. So they begin to hold tightly to the traditions that work so well for their ancestors. Kimmel states, a lot of men seem to hope that a reassertion of traditional ideologies of masculinity and a return to the exclusion of others from the competitive marketplace will somehow resolve this present malaise. And yet, as we've noted in the previous section, a return to tradition is not working. In fact, bringing up tradition only backfires in the faces of the very conservatives these angry white men support. I would argue that conservatives are feeling just as victimized as if the rug has been snatched from under them, and they no longer have a voice in our rapidly changing environment. They're getting angry because they bought into the possessive investment in whiteness and masculinity, and they're still being denied their rightful place at the top. They're being hunted, censored, misunderstood. Kimmel calls this pervasive anger aggrieved entitlement, the sense that those benefits to which you believe yourself entitled have been snatched away from you by unseen forces, larger and more powerful. You feel yourself to be the heir to a great promise, the American dream, which has turned into an impossible fantasy for the very people who were supposed to inherit it. At this stage in the narrative, angry white men and the conservatives whom they look up to don't know where to put this anger. It's eating them from the inside out, 
burning them up. All they know is that they are being denied something integral to their identity, and they don't know why. Kimmel argues that their earlier fear could be seen as productive. It was a way of holding back failure, a motivation that led them to be generative, entrepreneurial. But the anger that has been building, that's more defensive than anything else. It seeks to restore, to retrieve, to reclaim something that is perceived to have been lost. And all of that burning rage, all of that fear of failure and self-hatred, it finds its target in those directly below the angry white man. Thus, the war on woke comes better into focus. Conservatives have seen and understood the raw emotion baking in angry white men, and they have decided to embrace it. I would argue that they're not doing it because they care, and their efforts are certainly not more effective because they're so-called compassionate. Watch any Tucker Carlson lately? But they do it because it's useful. Conservative leaders have pathologized their numerous fears of failure and powerlessness into one targetable word. A word that covers almost every group they feel victimized by. Racial minorities, ethnic minorities, different religions, trans people, queer people. As Michael Harriet argues, it's hard to get people to demonize human beings and lives and history, but it's easy to get them to demonize a word. And if you can use that word as a placeholder for those people, for caring about those people, then it's easy to demonize instead of saying, we're just going to stop caring. The question is, what comes next? We'll find out next time on Big Cat News. I am your host, Shucker Parlson, signing off. Stay woke, my friends. I told you that was going to be really rough, so make sure to check out Two Dots by using the link in my description. Hopefully it'll help you unwind after that horrible, horrible information. <laughs> See you. Love you. Bye.